Hi guys, my name is Lauren. And I'm Jerry. I'm Chian. And we are now officially two drinks in. Hey, I had to put mine on the table, y'all. <laughs> well, because I cannot be on my head top for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> And that's because today we have a very, 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 very special guest with us. Today we have Philippa, who is a psychologist, mm-hmm. and she does some very special things. Um, the name of her company is. I can't remember. <laughs> What's the name of your company? Psychotherapy in nature. Psychotherapy, Psychotherapy in, in nature. nature. Can I start back from very, very sp- special guest? You can't buy us just going to keep all this. Oh, no, you're the <laughs> worst. Evil. So it's Evil. psychotherapy in nature. And I was very, very excited when I heard that. And it was actually Dr. Daniel, if you haven't watched that episode, go check it out. Yes. Who would have recommended, you know, you here. And mm-hmm. I was very excited because she told me a little bit about what you did and how you kind of use nature in with your with your practice. So, Philippa... Um, thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> thank you. Oh my God. So you want to tell us a little bit about what you do and your business and stuff like that? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I'm from the UK. Um, I've been practicing now about eight years. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trained as a psychologist, so I've sort of got that scientist practitioner identity. Mm-hmm. So I was trained originally in very traditional therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, but my background actually is um, with horses. So I used to be an international dressage rider and trainer. What? Um, and I've been, a, a, <laughs> right? uh, <laughs> I've been an animal lover all my life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And actually, Philippa means lover of horses. Oh, so everything from, makes sense. From age six, so <laughs> yeah. horse mad. Uh, and I was very lucky that when I started doing my bachelor in psychology, mm-hmm. that I stumbled across the literature for equine facilitated psychotherapy mm. um, around kind of emotion regulation and all the benefits like that mm-hmm. for yeah. people. So I thought, wow, how amazing that I could potentially combine my two passions, mm-hmm. psychology and equine yeah. together. So that's how it first started. And I had a company in the UK called Equine Enlightenment, mm-hmm. which was combining um, traditional psychological services. So mm-hmm. anything you can think of from assessment, consultation, um, all therapies with nature, um, canine and equine assisted. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. Oh my gosh. No, I'm also horse mad. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Like I actually had like a black beauty collection. That was the story. I kid you not. I had it in like all the different prints and edits and rewrites and everything. I had it. Like, nice. So to have somebody else on that little mm-hmm. horse. <laughs> like, oh my God. Oh, yeah. oh gosh. So cool. So, um, question, right? Cause like, obviously with the same love for, um, horses, especially, um, I would have seen like a whole bunch of um, literature and even movies they've been making about the way people interact with, um, especially like people with PTSD and stuff like that with animals and how that actually kind of helps them to reintegrate into society and stuff like that. Like, um, would you say that that could still be a useful tool outside of um, therapies regarding PTSD and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm actually published in that area. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Um, on rewiring the brain when people have experienced trauma, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically working with equine facilitated psychotherapy. Oh. Um, so when you're in a room-based setting, we are reliant on what we call top-down talking or cognitive therapies. Mm-hmm. So we are reliant on those cognitive processes. And actually what happens when we experience trauma is part of the brain called Broca's area which is responsible for retrieving working verbal memory, Mm -hmm. shuts down. And so if you sit someone in front of you in a room-based setting Mm. and they're still in a certain point of their their trauma process, Mm -hmm. it's almost like sitting in front of what we call kind of um, a rabbit in headlights. Mm. You know, know, the brain, that part of the brain is shut down. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think, therefore, there is a... A weakness to some of the cognitive mm-hmm. methodologies mm. Um, and we do need something else potentially that's going to be non-verbal and yeah. also what we what we call a top sorry a bottom-up mm-hmm. process so you, mm. you're working from the body upwards mm. which is a bit more gentle that's oh. amazing yeah and I actually think it's it's really needed in this time because yeah. I mean we've talked about this over and over and over again on this podcast like the amount of stress 
that we as young people, I mean, and we can only speak from our, you yeah. know, our experiences, right? Mm-hmm. Can't swear we speak for everybody. Correct. But we as young people that have experience and are experiencing not only, you know, in this time because of the pandemic, but just in general. Yeah. You know, because even before the pandemic, like a lot of the um, mental health issues that we've been facing as a generation mm-hmm. have been at the front of conversation because mm-hmm. they're that prevalent, like they're that you know in your face that's right yeah Yeah. and i think um that leads us nicely onto another topic which is the stigma (laughs) particularly in barbados Mm -hmm. around accessing or engaging in um Mm -hmm. therapies or even just admitting that there's something wrong with you you understand like i for one right um because i have um depression i i deal with depression um oh i think that's like the first time i said that in public anyway ha but I, for one, have been really um, cautious about discussing it because it's mm-hmm. like our com- our community as a whole in Barbados c- tends to kind of like be like, oh, learn, you know, like mm-hmm. that's the worst thing or whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. But I've been high functioning, um, depressed for many years Mm -hmm. and I've still been showing up doing all of my work doing all the things you Mm -hmm. know but obviously at at some point you kind of have to like a step back and you know fix things or Mm -hmm. they get worse you know um so the stigma in Barbados as a whole is definitely a huge huge thing and I I could say that with my chest Mm -hmm. like from being on the inside of it Mm. it's definitely a thing yeah, and I think that's why I'm really passionate about my company mm-hmm. here, which is Psychotherapy in Nature, because mm-hmm. I'm offering a completely different framework. So you can come and hang out in nature. Yeah. We can do forest bathing. We can go and do equine therapy. Mm-hmm. We can go for a walk and talk on the beach. Mm-hmm. And I think if people can frame it differently in their mind that they're not coming to sit in a room with a stranger. And I'm like, yes. oh, what am I going to talk about? It's going to be awkward. <laughs> I'm going to feel trapped. Yeah. What if I want to leave? Mm-hmm. It's very different. Yeah. And especially because of the pandemic, where you already kind of feel trapped when yep. you go into small spaces That's anyway, because right, you're stuck inside for so absolutely. long. And there's an added anxiety for a lot of people around mm-hmm. that fear. Yeah. In terms of COVID, and and when you're in an outside environment, it's safer, obviously, to to be apart and to have your mask off, which is really important when you're working therapeutically, because yeah. we're humans at the end of the day. Yeah. So to have the mask there removes all of the facial expressions mm-hmm. yeah. and the understanding that we can share between each other. Yeah. yeah. Mm. well that's crazy because even i don't think so at my my i, I don't have depression per se um, mm-hmm. I, I have anxiety a lot mm-hmm. i have anxiety to the point that i have acid reflux mm. and like i can literally tell when i'm like stressed out because i start to feel like i'm, I'm creating ulcers in my stomach mm. and for a very long time i was like and i would have friends say Laurie, you should just go talk to somebody and i'd be like no mm-hmm. nothing's wrong with me I'm fine. There's nothing I can talk to about somebody who, you know, that I can't do on my own. I'm very good at self-soothing, I like to say. Um, but I feel like part of that is from this whole, this idea in this society that you have to be strong. Yeah. And you have to be able to deal with things on your own. And you have to be able to kind of just go on and deal things. And like, I feel like maybe it was a while ago when somebody put a name on it and was telling me, but you're having panic attacks. That's yeah. what's happening. You're literally panicking. Yeah. yeah. Right? And I was like, oh, shoot, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe yeah, I should maybe look at different ways, you know. And there's but, a way to fix it. But we grew up in a society it. where it's like, mm-mm, you just need to, you know. Yeah. Just push on through. Yeah, push on through. You can get it done. Yeah. We, we all did it. Mm-hmm. You know? which is fascinating and I'm so glad that you guys have been so honest and transparent and yeah. shown that vulnerability because actually depression and anxiety are part of the human condition mm-hmm. yeah so we can understand depression and anxiety as uh, in a non-pathologizing way because what you're all describing is related to what we call the medical model so mm-hmm. that's where you try and di- diagnose and you pathologize mm-hmm. the issue within the person mm-hmm. whereas we've got another model called the biopsychosocial mm-hmm. model Mm -hmm. where we look at um, the whole of the person, the body, the mind, Mm -hmm. and all the systems they're part of. So Mm -hmm. their school, their family, their home, their relationships, their work, because we are all part of systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love what I do in terms of nature, because we're looking at ecosystems and we're part Mm -hmm. of nature. Yeah. I love that. 
I love that. Because honestly, even for me, like, do we not just be like, okay, we need a beach day? Yeah. Like, yeah. every single one yeah. of us goes <laughs> to, ner- to nature in some form or fashion. <laughs> we need whenever. to be outside, yeah. Yeah. Like, I feel like up to this week, we were like, okay, we're going outside. Yeah. <laughs> we are outside. Exactly. We went to the beach. We went um, driving. I hit her through the yeah. yonder. You know, unfortunately, Lauren couldn't make it because yes. she was at work. She was at work. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a thing. It's a thing. Even this week, I'm about to go. Um, my manager, we're out, actually about to take, one, take the boat out and go fishing. And... I am so looking forward to that. Mm-hmm. And then next week, I'm planning on going to the spring, by the way. Nice. Oh, PSA. let me know where you're going mm-hmm. this spring. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Because it's, it's, it's very grounding. Um, I've definitely been having like a, a low for like the last couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. And I find when I get out and I go about and I get into the sun, I like go mm-hmm. run around in the grass for a little bit or whatever like get into the garden anything like that like I find I feel better so that's how like when you said you mix the two of them together mm-hmm. I was like oh that makes sense like why isn't that like a widespread thing you know yeah. like why why isn't it a, wi- a widespread thing there are a really number answer. of reasons and I have to say I've had a mixed response from other professionals here mm-hmm. and I think people can feel um I've you know I've I've heard other psychologists I'm calling it or referring to it as hocus pocus. What? Uh, I think there's a slight fear. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I've been working in in this area of psychology for many, many years, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've built relationships with national health services, leading charities, mm-hmm. international um, residential rehabilitation centres. Yeah. And when you're coming up against sort of the bigger companies, so mm-hmm. you have done a lot of work with government services, social services, yeah. those types of things. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to be tight on your risk assessments, your your policies, mm-hmm. um, and being able to work safely. And the yeah. biggest thing that comes up for people in these types of services is the risk. Mm-hmm. So if, you know, there are a number of different presentations that might be high risk, mm-hmm. and that could be forensic, that could be borderline personality disorder Mm -hmm. uh, or anybody with trauma really that's self-harming or might be under the influence of a drug alcohol Mm -hmm. or perhaps just feeling unstable or dysregulated in their system yeah Mm -hmm. if you're working outside then then professionals could argue that there's more of a risk Mm. actually I've just written another publication and it's 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 basically looking at you know again we need to be updating the way that we work with Mm -hmm. people yeah um, and I've framed it so that practitioners wanting to move their practice outside, mm-hmm. um, that they can do so. So I've actually sort of put in quite a thorough table mm-hmm. of many different presentations mm-hmm. and the risks and how you might overcome those. Okay. That's because that's another thing that I do is that I'm a qualified clinical supervisor. Mm-hmm. Oh. So I supervise the practitioner's work. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's not yet a legal requirement here, but mm-hmm. around the world, mostly in the Western culture, mm-hmm. is a legal requirement to have at least 90 minutes with a supervisor mm-hmm. um, to check that you're working ethically, to check on the, the safeguarding and the mm-hmm. interventions that you might be using, the impact it's having on them. Um, that needs to be a thing here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Badly. We've mm-hmm. had can these we, conversations. Can we have to go to the schools? Because <laughs> the, the counseling available at schools, oh, yeah. that's shaky. And then what's sad about it, right, is that at that, at that age is, is one of the ages where you're, you're going through a lot of changes hormonally like physically you know even what you're learning like there is such mm-hmm. a shift in what you're going through and yeah. like the guidance that you have <laughs> guidance guidance counselors <laughs> the guidance that you have is lacking at best mm. yeah you know at worst it's it's almost sometimes a little bit like i don't want to say abusive but yeah like some of the things and the stories i've heard girl you know, i could tell you stories i remember from and this is my personal experience. I spoke to my guidance counselor. My grandmother had passed away. And I spoke to my guidance counselor um, about it because like, I realized that I wasn't able to like pay attention in class the way I was supposed to and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And like, I legitimately was spending more time in the bathroom crying than <laughs> in my classroom. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went to the guidance counselor. I was like, hey, like, um, I don't know what to do. This is how I feel. I know I need to pass my exams because I want to go up. And I don't want to stay here. Um, like, help, you know? And we sat, we talked for a little bit. She was like, okay, well, you're, you're kind of doing the right thing. Like, ask for an excuse if you don't want to be in the class and disrupt the class with 
your um, credit and stuff like that. If you want to, you instead of going to the bathroom, you can come to me and have a sit with me, blah, 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 that kind of thing, right? I was like, okay, cool, no problem. Um, at no point did I say it was okay to share my loss with anyone. Mm. But by the time I got to my next class, all of my teachers and some of my peers had already known that my grandmother passed. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was like, I felt like I spoke to you. I didn't speak to all these people and mm -hmm. you didn't even like speak to me and say, Hey, like, would it, would it be possible for me to like speak to these people and let them know what's going mm -hmm. on or whatever? No, she just shared the info mm -hmm. to everybody. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so, it, mm. so now instead of school being a place where it could go where I wasn't hearing, oh, we're sorry for your loss every single day, mm -hmm. you know, it became that space, mm. which with grief, like not everyone Absolutely. wants that. Yeah. Not and everyone you, wants that constantly. Sometimes you don't even know how to answer people. Yeah, it's like, mm. yeah, I'm sorry too. Mm -hmm. It sucks. I'd rather my grandma was here. Yeah. You and, know? Yeah. And ultimately what you're saying is that a safe space is it turned safe? into an mm -hmm. unsafe space mm -hmm. and there was that real betrayal of trust yeah and i feel like if if there if there were people assessing those situations mm -hmm. like how how you come and you sit in um to me that's that's my practice right that's like you're not doing the thing you're supposed to do right you'd be able to say hey that's not actually the right course of action um and have like a course correction happen that could actually help somebody mm -hmm. else down the lane right mm -hmm. but because we don't have that here as far as i can see like mm -hmm. they just do whatever they want to and it's not always for the best for the person that they're mm -hmm. trying to help I, i'm not saying she wasn't trying to help me i'm sure she was but it wasn't helpful for me because i just felt like there was another space mm -hmm. where i was the girl who lost her grandma mm -hmm. yeah sure, you know sure yeah so anyway for sure. I mean, um, when we're looking at ethical codes of practice, one of the mm -hmm. biggest principles is confidentiality. It does become a bit tricky and it doesn't matter what country you're in. Yeah. If you're employed by the school and you're working with someone under 18, um, you are always looking to do the best by your yeah. client. And in schools, the boundaries do sometimes get a bit blurred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't speak for your school or that individual situation, mm -hmm. but I do within my private practice and when I'm supervising other practitioners that work with young people, yeah. I'm tight on my boundaries because for me, my experience and also the research evidence mm -hmm. shows that without confidentiality, you haven't got the trust within your relationship mm -hmm. and consequently Correct. your your therapy is not going to be effective. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. And, you know, and that's mostly our work with young people as practitioners is about managing the parents mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they're the ones that want the information and often there's something that for me is going on within the family system mm -hmm. that's creating perhaps issues within the, within the young person. Yeah. Yeah, it gets really challenging navigating um, just te being a teenager um, and then not being able to speak to people who you're supposed to be able to speak to. So Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it was know, definitely a thing. I, you know, I can hear that. And, yeah. and again, for me as a practitioner, I'm very passionate about um, being an advocate for young people. And like mm -hmm. I say, you know, yeah. that confidentiality is crucial. Miss mm. um, Prime Minister? If you're hearing this, uh, we would like to speak about how we can get um, a Philippa mm -hmm. in the oh, schools. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Senator K. McConney, I think, is the Minister of, of Education. Well, Minister of Education, we are also speaking to you. Thank so you so much. Senator, yes. and we would love it. Um, I definitely do think, and I know I don't want to, you know, always give Jackie jacket. No, no. I do think they have been, and it was they, definitely not in our time because it was a teacher who was a guidance counselor. Come on. But in, I think they've been making an assertive effort mm -hmm. to train teachers to be guidance counselors, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is still a bit different from psychology. Right. Right. But they, I, I do think they have been making a little bit more of an effort. I, I, I will um, agree. In, in that regard. I do think that we need to take it even further. Mm -hmm. You know, I find very often, all the way up, all the way through our society, I don't think it's just young people. I think, like, people our age, young adults, I think older adults, you know, I think we just brush mental illness and stress and anxiety mm -hmm. aside. Mm -hmm. I mean, like... Because you should just be strong. You should just be getting yeah, through it. Like, like, everybody else, before you do it, yeah. my grandmother do it, my auntie do it, my great grandmother do it, what you can oh, you do it too. it was easy doing this, da 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 it wasn't easy, mm -hmm. but we can't do. So you I have a question, it. though. Yeah. 
So after your experience with your mm-hmm. your situation at school, did you ever try um, traditional therapy after that? Um, so I did um, in recent years. Mm-hmm. So like literally like the last three years, um, I did try um, therapy. But again, it still wasn't technically traditional therapy because it was online. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, okay. It wasn't I came and I sat in a room with anybody. Um, it was um, better help. Mm -hmm. I used that app Mm -hmm. and they hooked me up with a therapist in California or something like Mm -hmm. that. And we sat and we walked through a couple of things I had struggles with. And she Mm -hmm. gave me some like little tips on how I could like create like better practices in my life. Mm -hmm. um, So I could better navigate how I was feeling and stuff like that. But even even with that process, it took me so long to get to the point where I could video call with her Mm -hmm. versus because I like for probably... Because I, I saw her for like nearly a year mm-hmm. and it was only in the last three months of that year that we started doing video calls mm-hmm. and actual phone calls okay. versus us typing because her being a person was such a hard thing for me to like mm-hmm. trust. To trust. Mm-hmm. Like just mm-hmm. her being a computer was easier for me to mm-hmm. navigate than it being someone who has family and friends and co-workers and all that they can just go sit in mm-hmm. and, and and she's in another country she's not even here and mm-hmm. it still like bothered me you know um so even for like i was actually looking for a therapist here um at the end of last year i was going girl in here about to knock you out with this mic <laughs> anyway <laughs> so i was looking for a therapist here last year mm-hmm. and like I called an office. My mom got me a number and I called the office a few times. And every time someone would pick up, I'd be like, oh, never mind. Because the idea of going mm-hmm. into an office here, oh my God, like, mm-hmm. I could not wrap my brain around it. Like, in my head, I'm like, okay, not only am <laughs> I, like, I'm not just a random person on the street, I, mm-hmm. I'm also an artist. And that makes me a public figure. Right. Even if I'm not like the most Mm well-known artist ever in life, you know, but people know me, people are familiar Mm -hmm. with me. And if this person goes and says, "Okay, well, let me have this conversation about, you know, Xi'an's life. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, that's my personal things. That's Mm -hmm. just going all the way around, Mm -hmm. you know. And how do I trust that that's not going to be the case? Mm -hmm. Because case in point, you know. It's interesting because we're back to that subject of confidentiality again. Yeah. Uh, It's uh, and that's the thing. So, like, be- because of all the stigmas that we experience in society around mental health, mm-hmm. um, that's where that's why confidentiality is such a huge point for so many people. Because it's like, if it wasn't like a problem, if it wasn't a big deal, mm-hmm. you know, in society, then somebody gonna talk about it. Yeah, mm-hmm. that'd be annoying. Yeah, it'd be uncomfortable. But it wouldn't be like, oh, this is gonna affect mm-hmm. work. This is gonna affect this oh, thing. Yeah. You and know? it's the degrees of separation we have here in Barbados. Yeah. I mean, all I need to do is go and speak to somebody else and we can know somebody that you know, somebody that Gian knows, and we don't even need to be in the same circles. Yeah. So, you you know, you go say somebody, oh, you know who came into the office today and this is what she said, blah, blah, blah. And you say in you know, to your best friend. Mm-hmm. Your best friend will say it to somebody else. That person knows you and all of a sudden you're, especially in Barbados, with how small and how <laughs> close-knit a society we are. Yeah. You know, I, I do see why it's an issue, you know. And I think that's sure. one of the reasons why um, young persons don't necessarily want to go in because of that with the stigma. Mm-hmm. But how would you... So... I think we all have people in our lives who, and maybe even us, who should probably see somebody and get them to talk to. How, what, what do you think would be a good way to get us young people who are struggling, you know, to kind of feel comfortable with the process? Like, how do you talk to your friends? Okay, maybe, maybe it's not you know a bad thing to go see somebody without it being you should go see somebody. You know you. Mm-hmm. You know, like how do you how how would you suggest bringing that up with necessary? Say you have a friend who maybe should see somebody because they're struggling a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great question to ask because, as you say, everyone has someone close to them that's struggling mm-hmm. somehow. Um, I think it's a really tricky subject because 
certainly from a psychologist or a therapist's point of view, um, if someone is pushed or forced before they're ready to engage, mm -hmm. it's not going to work. So I generally, even if, you know, if it's a parent and an adult child even, you know, I do have to try and see them, even if it's with their supporting person, you know, in the assessment stage, because they have to, they have to want it for themselves, mm -hmm. because Correct. otherwise it's not sustainable and they're not going to engage. Mm -hmm. And they really, they have to be ready. So sometimes the kindest thing to do is actually just to be there as a support. Mm -hmm. um, I think definitely arm them with as much information as you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on services. So they've got it there. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the hardest thing, but the, the kindest thing, is actually just to be with someone when they're going through something. We don't mm -hmm. always have to do, mm -hmm. and I think that's a mistake and can be actually quite traumatizing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got friends or family trying to tell us, fix up, look smart. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Be strong. I all get this it. Stuff. Mm -hmm. And okay. actually, interesting, we find that with practitioners too. It's one of the most common things that, um, particularly with newly qualified practitioners, Oh. They want to do all the interventions. They want to do all the trickery. They want to do this modality, that modality. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I find myself often saying, you know, how about just being with mm -hmm. the client in the room, human to human? Yeah. Mm. I don't know if you've ever been curious about this, but mm -hmm. cat people and dog people. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's such a thing? I don't know, because I love dogs too. Mm-hmm. Like, I could love a dog. I had a dog named Anna. She was a bull mastiff mixed with a great name. Mm -hmm. And she was my favorite thing in the whole wide world. Mm -hmm. I also have four cats who are now my favorite thing in the whole wide world. Yeah. So I feel like, for me, I like cats right now because I'm in that point in my life mm -hmm. where I want a cat energy. I want to be able to lay down in bed till 8.30. Right. Because they're very self-sufficient. Yeah, yeah, and just have the food there and not, you know, not get Y'all's cat is weird. Don't look at, <laughs> don't look at us like that. If I get her at 5 o'clock, she is waiting outside the bedroom for her wow. food. But cat, cat and she will different. trot all the way over to her bowl and be like, so when are you going to feed me though? Service. I mean, don't get me wrong. Service. When Russell <laughs> opens the door in the morning, my cats literally come and run into bed mm -hmm. and jump and lay down right by my feet. Mm. And if I take too long to get up, Bella comes and she does meow. Oh, you will hear her scratching at the door. Yeah. Right? Uh, I love that, like, when you guys are all talking about animals, you, like, really light up. <laughs> and I think, you know, that, for me, is part of the work that I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I actually heard, interestingly, on the radio, I can't remember which radio station it was yesterday, mm -hmm. I was quite surprised to hear this in Barbados because my understanding of um, Bayesians and relationships with animals is not as common as in the Western world. Mm -hmm. But they were talking about the therapeutic benefits of having a pet. Mm -hmm. um, they were talking about some research which has been around for probably about a decade Ever now, now. <laughs> right? but they were referring to it as new research so perhaps there's more research mm -hmm. but yeah. you know it's, it's well known that um, stroking a cat or a dog or, or being around them mm -hmm. lowers yep. your cortisol which is a stress hormone yeah. lowers your heart rate mm -hmm. I think my dog yeah. knows too because she finds me whenever I'm upset and she just goes like right up that's on that's right mm -hmm. absolutely ma'am mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's true, and yeah. that's actually what I'm I'm published in with the horses. Mm -hmm. So in terms of um, brain similarity, mm -hmm. other than our primates, horses have the most similar limbic brain mm -hmm. to us, really? and then it's dogs, and then it's mm -hmm. cats. Ah. So the limbic brain is really important. It's the same part of the brain that we share with all mammals, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the limbic brain is the oldest brain, mm -hmm. oldest part of the brain. So mm -hmm. it's like the reptilian, responsible for fight, flight, freeze. Mm -hmm. emotion wow. regulation so when we stroke a cat or a dog and it doesn't matter which way around it it could be mm -hmm. that your dog is distressed and you stroke your dog mm -hmm. what you're actually um, experiencing is what we call limbic resonance and that's when two mammals are tuned to each other through empathy and after limbic resonance you can then start to restructure the brain because mm -hmm. you can start to respond to traumatic triggers in your environment in a different way so then you're recreating the, um, the neural pathways. So coming on to anxiety, mm -hmm. this is a really important conversation. So when we experience anxiety or trauma, it's, we, we get stuck on this loop. So what is it, what it is is in our environment, we have certain triggers mm -hmm. that affect us, mm -hmm. that trigger the fight, flight, freeze mm -hmm. response, which is the primal response. That's why I'm saying to you, anxiety is part of the human condition. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. okay. Um, but it's almost like when we, when we are stuck on that loop, when we're stuck with anxiety or trauma, 
we it's like a faulty alarm system. So with, with these triggers that are, that are here, they feed into our mm-hmm. nervous system mm-hmm. and then they feed straight into neural pathways, straight into that fight, fight, freeze. And that then is our emotional and behavioral response mm-hmm. to our environment. And so the cycle continues. And with anxiety comes all sorts of um, chemical release, such as adrenaline. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because again, anxiety or you know the trauma response or any activation in the limbic brain is a primal response. It's there for safety. Yeah. So adrenaline will be released, and, and the blood does need to pump to, you know, the limbs, the main organs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And often people that experience anxiety, they they lose their appetite. Yeah. Because the digestive system will shut down in oh, order wow. for the blood to go to the muscles for you to run from mm-hmm. danger for it to go to the organs that you mm-hmm. need. Um, so that's anxiety way of understanding mm-hmm. when you're stuck. But depression as well, mm-hmm. we can understand that as being um, very animalistic. So animals, for example, they, they go through grief and loss and stress. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what they do often is they'll go and climb under a rock or they'll hibernate for a while. Yeah. They'll regroup, they'll rest and restore physically, mm-hmm. mentally, mm-hmm. and then they'll come out again. Whereas in society today, as right, you right, mentioned right, earlier, going, yeah. right, stay strong, but that's not sustainable for our physio- physiological system. But the other thing also, another way to understand it is that um, anxiety is mobilization. Mm-hmm. So when we're mobile and we're moving to get mm-hmm. ourselves away from stress and, and danger, mm-hmm. whereas depression, that would be linked with immobilization. Mm-hmm. So that's your freeze state. Mm-hmm. So they both serve primal survival features and functions. <sighs> My mind is blown. I, I, was, I was about to say, we can really like, to take a second to digest. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Because like, mm-hmm. when you think, when you hear about anxiety and depression mm-hmm. and, and various mental health issues, um, like you immediately think, is something that's wrong mm-hmm. with your system. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like it's something that's off with your system. What you're describing is basically your body trying to take care of you yeah. in a situation. So it's like, I'm shook. Like <laughs> I want to cry and I want to laugh all at the same time. Yeah. Like, it's so, oh my God. And I think it's really important because for me, what you said about the keep going with the anxiety is something mm-hmm. that I personally experience. Yeah. I don't ever get to that. I'm, I'm My anxiety for me is that I have to keep doing something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're not doing enough. What are you doing? Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Until I get to the point where my brain is moving too fast. Like I'm literally dizzy. I can't do it anymore. Yeah. My brain is actually, it can't like mm-hmm. take the speed at which things are happening. Mm-hmm. And I need to like find a way to recenter and to get everything mm. to stop. Correct. And usually it's crying or screaming or something like that. Sometimes actually just stopping and writing down the things that are making me anxious mm-hmm. and then like helps. If I start to actually panic, what I do is I do something that is that I need to like think about. So I start multiplying numbers because you get when I add the numbers, I can't mm-hmm. like, I can't multiply up, but I can add up. Mm-hmm. Right, because then you get to a point where like two plus two is four, four plus four is eight, sixteen, sixteen is thirty-two. You get to a number where you actually have to sit down and like do the working. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the fact that my brain has to stop and do the working it divert from all the other things, and it helps me to like oh. breathe, and I just go and I go and I go till I can stop and I can recenter. But I think it's that fact of the going that it took me so long to realize. Oh shoot, this anxiety though, mm. because it never felt like yes, I would panic, and I can understand that. Mm-hmm. You know, that the, that moment of panic was... But I, I never actually got, like, felt like, Lauren, you suffer from anxiety. Yeah. So then I'd be having all sorts of acid reflux and all sorts of things and all sorts of... And I would be like, hmm, why are these things happening? And I'm very, like, y'all know, I'm very much into <laughs> the body-mind spiritual mm. thing. Yeah. I definitely believe that our bodies respond to our mental health. Oh, yeah, they do. And our physical health responds to our mental health. That's I'm right. very yeah. much there. So I could always tell physically that I was having anxiety because I'd have lots of acid reflux and all of a sudden I'd be filling, refilling my, my prescription. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But mentally, because it was a feeling of let's go, let's go, let's go, let's keep going, let's keep doing... Which is a little bit what our society tells us mm. we should be doing. Mm. You know, you, say, you have the job, you have the you side say. hustle, you work the nine to five, you come Correct. home, you work the side hustle, but when do you rest? That's right. And it's such an interesting point because you're describing society. So it's not like you guys are alone in what mm-hmm. you're describing. It's really common because, like, you know, say again, it's a human part of the human mm-hmm. condition. 
Um, but you're starting to describe inner and outer worlds. So your inner world right now is just using you as an example. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got this anxiety, you've got this acid reflux. Mm-hmm. But in your outer world, you are going to work and you're mm-hmm. functioning. Yeah. Um, but when we start to have a disparity and a conflict between our inner and outer worlds, mm-hmm. um, living with that internal conflict existentially for us, how mm-hmm. we're existing in the world, sometimes leads to an existential crisis. Yeah, it just doesn't get to a point, it just doesn't work anymore. It's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. What you're both describing, which is really common for everyone, Mm -hmm. is you're maintaining. You're maintaining in terms of functioning, Mm -hmm. but not actually disrupting Mm -hmm. the cycle. Yeah. And that's so common for everyone. And in order to function when we're not feeling right, Mm -hmm. we do cut off our bodies Mm -hmm. from our minds. And oh people God. do that in a number of different Shook. ways. Goosebumps, right? Drinking, mm-hmm. smoking, yeah. sex, mm-hmm. gaming, working, talking fast, isolating, <laughs> numbing, <laughs> you know? Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, you know. Uh, like over a shirt collar. I mean, I mean, come for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. She is dragging us. Yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, so then I think the next question should be, mm. how do we, like, how do we disrupt the cycle? Like, like what do we do? Like, how do yeah. we disrupt it? Yeah. I think it's checking in with our bodies, though. Because before, like, I used to get these horrible, horrible panic attacks that would land me in the hospital. Oh, Lord of mercy. I, every time I had one, I would feel like I was having a heart attack. Oh. And I feel like I've spoken mm-hmm. to you guys about this before. Mm-hmm. I just got used to just sitting down and maybe checking in with my body. And, you know, just thinking about where Mm -hmm. I might be lacking Mm -hmm. as far as how I was taking care of myself and trying to get ahead of it to avoid having those panic attacks. Wow. Well, that's very um, self-aware of you (laughs) because I ain't getting it. (laughs) It's hard. It's tough. Yeah. Also, what we need to think about is, again, these are primal responses. So Mm -hmm. we have felt unsafe at some point, Mm -hmm. possibly in childhood, because we're so adaptable as children mm-hmm. in our family systems and pretty much 99.9% of the time, we, there is no such thing as normal or perfect mm-hmm. family. Yeah. And so we just adapt because our brains are um, mm-hmm. they're malleable at that mm-hmm. stage. And so we end up going through childhood and um, teenage and, and often you know, when we're adults, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, mm-hmm. show up for therapy because the coping strategies that we've learned in those environments, they just don't, they stop working for us. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I hear it time and time again. I feel so stupid because I'm 70 and I'm just coming into therapy because I had a bad relationship with my mum. But this is now my coping strategy and how I've learned to deal with this relationship mm-hmm. or that mm-hmm. one. Yeah. And it's just not working for me and it's ruining my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I get that. I really, really do. I get it. Because, like, like I was telling you guys earlier, like the idea of going to see a specialist it's really, really hard to navigate. I'm not going to because like sometimes you are you're fully aware of the fact that you really do need to sit and speak to somebody, but like just navigating the idea of actually doing it, ooh, that could be tricky sometimes. Mm-hmm. It's not going. Yeah, I mean sitting and talking to someone. I have it in my therapeutic contract at the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, just laying it all out there. You know, it can be really uncomfortable. It can be messy. Mm-hmm. It can bring up feelings of shame, disgust, mm-hmm. guilt, mm-hmm. anger, sadness, pain. And it's a lot, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's not just in the session. Sometimes that's in between sessions Mm -hmm, because you mm -hmm. keep processing in between. Of course. And, you know, of course, you've got to be ready Mm -hmm. to do it because you've got to be ready to sort of make yourself vulnerable. Wow. What is the outcome here thinking? Oh, we're going to speak to Philip, a psychologist. Yeah. It's gonna be great. And I like I'm like, oh gosh, no, you should probably go see Philippa. You right. probably need some therapy. <laughs> I'm like, the amount of notes I'm taking right now. Right? <laughs> I think oh it can benefit God. all of us. I'm about to rewatch this episode. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so many times. Uh at this point, if you have not done so, feel free to and you know what we're gonna say and I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna get it right. Come on. Click on that like button. Come on. Smash that subscribe button Come on. and hit that notification bell exactly. so that you can get notified, you know? Also, feel free to rewatch this episode. Exactly. We will. And Definitely. I still haven't come up with a drinking game yet, but I got you guys. I'm working on it, okay? <laughs> I'm working on it, okay? I'm doing the website, the, 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 the rewatching so I can get the research done, so I can get you guys a drinking game. I got you guys covered for the break, okay? But guess what? 
if you aren't having a tranky drink drank with us, how are you going to give us your tipsy thought of the day? <laughs> how? And we want to hear from you. We want you in the comment section below. Tell us things. Tell us your experience. You yeah. Know? What's your experience with mental health in Barbados? Mm -hmm. What's that look like? What was the one thing that you took away from this episode? Tell me. Oh my gosh. And maybe you're not even from Barbados. Yeah. I mean, because we have people that, you know. That's true. Live elsewhere that come on. They from the UK. From <laughs> they just want to see so From Australia. Beast, you know, Do we have any Australians? That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Hi. <laughs> hey, down under. I can't wink, so I'm just going to close both my eyes. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, in the future too, if you, if you guys mm -hmm. want to do and open it up, you know, mm -hmm. for questions about mental health, yeah. we can come back and we can do an interactive oh session with people. Yo, oh, she volunteered to come back. Y'all heard that. Y'all heard that, right? She so you know what's going to happen. <laughs> what's going to happen. We got it on camera. We exactly. did. <laughs> Oh man, so we definitely have to sit and chat again because honestly, this has been very, like, very insightful. Yeah. Oh, I have so much to process. <laughs> it's so cool because even like just reworking how we think and look at um, depression and anxiety, I think that alone mm -hmm. should be a huge conversation we have yeah. because. Mm -hmm. Like you keep re-emphasizing it as you go around and answer the questions that we are been, we've been tossing at you all night. <laughs> but this idea that it's a part of the human condition, so it's nothing strange, it's nothing foreign, mm -hmm. nothing wrong mm -hmm. is happening. It's just you need to pay attention to this area. Yeah. You know, versus oh my god, like it's something to fix. Because I've always felt like it was something I needed mm -hmm. to fix. You yeah. know, um, but from talking to you it doesn't feel like a, a fix it feels like a figure out how to navigate versus mm -hmm. a fix you know what i mean yeah. like I it's not something you, wrong what you said earlier about because yeah, i think you'd asked um well how do we break the cycle mm -hmm. yeah and how? you answered it nail on the head we've got to <laughs> focus on that mm -hmm. reconnection with body and mind and mm -hmm. something you were talking about earlier as well lauren in terms of recentering yeah. grounding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know that's all part of getting back in the body and everybody does it differently mm -hmm. Um, so if you have to use um, cognition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in terms of navigating your environment and mm -hmm. then just becoming aware and present within the room, yeah. then that's for you. And then mm -hmm. other people need to do breath work. And mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, I can teach people various different um, strategies, which maybe would be helpful mm -hmm. for people today. Mm -hmm. So um, human touch is really important. So there's tons of evidence on the importance Oof. of touch, hugging. So we'll have a chemical oh, released no. in the brain. Oh, listen, listen. <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy, happy you brought that up. Because I don't want those people who believe in four hugs a day. They do. Okay. Right? Yeah. I, I believe in touch. <laughs> and I believe that one of the one of the reasons, and we can talk about this later. And then yeah. one last question I have for you. But one of the things that happened during COVID is that we literally isolated ourselves. Some people were quarantining by themselves. Some people nobody. spent months by themselves. Yeah. And there was nobody to hug them and nobody to touch them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, even up to this day, I've been walking around and I've been like, oh, I'm going to hug you, but... I'm like, there's just a little bit of a loss. Like, I feel like a little bit like I'm getting to terms with it. Mm -hmm. Because I'm definitely a hugger. I'm definitely that person she is. who no. would have seen you coming I into the house <laughs> and open my hands. Yeah. I would have hugged you and I would have been like, it's okay. And I would I actually start hugging people before they get the chance. I'm like, ah, I don't want to be hugged. <laughs> because like, hugs to me. She's a so trap, And that's girl. me. Yeah, I'm always like... like <laughs> but we're, just, we're converting her slowly but surely no, because like to me yes, like <laughs> there's there's something important about like human touch yeah you know it's definitely i never put a name to it but anyone who has met me pre-pandemic can tell you i'm like hi i'm chian i'm a hugger that's literally mm -hmm. my intro literally my intro because yeah. it's, it's it just feels good like you feel that's like right. well that's there's some this. exchange there that happens that's so lovely yeah yeah. And that's um, the chemical oxytocin. Mm. Mm. Yeah. My good girl, that's so All the feel good, the dopamine, the yeah. oxytocin. Yeah. And it helps to regulate our system. It gives us that feel good factor. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, bring up a great point in terms of um, the pandemic at the moment and the isolation and mm -hmm. lacking human touch. Um, and one of the things that I teach people to do in terms of grounding and self-regulation and um, you know, if you're feeling desperate, anxious, depressed, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. is touch. Mm -hmm. And we forget that actually we can do that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we can mm. 
Well, so if you, if you guys put your drinks down and just do this with me and see how just it like, feels. Stop drinking. <laughs> stop enough drinking. now. It's enough. <laughs> and then move down your arms and see how it feels to rub your hands together and hold your hands. And then maybe something mm. around your back and your neck and your face and your hair. And run your hands through and just see how it feels. Mm. Why well, you know I love this one? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, here's my favorite You part. know I love yeah. this one. We're here for this one. So how, how was that? How did it feel? I'm hearing a lot of sighs. I'm not going you know? to lie. I feel right. <laughs> This is good. I feel like I'm adorable. Good. Like... Yeah, so there you go. Like. It's funny because we forget I to do that. To, yeah. yeah. But if you think sometimes, you know, our bodies are so important and we are connected to them all the time and we mm. kind of forget that we, we can give that f- for ourselves. Wow. So that's a lovely grounding exercise to do mm. if we're feeling out of sorts. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a really nice one that we can do together as well. Mm-hmm. It's, it sounds and seems quite basic, but it's really effective. So I'll just demonstrate. I'm going to turn my head. Mm. And really slowly move my head around the room and just take in every single detail. So I'm noticing some colors on the door, the type of doorknob, that it's got a lock, the light switch, the different colors on the wall. You literally take in every single detail and maybe stuff that you don't usually notice, fixtures and fittings that you might not see, lines that aren't so straight, curves in the wall. And go all the way around as far as you can with turning your head. Just remembering to stay connected to your breath as well. Just noticing what your breath's doing. And then once you've gone all the way around, just coming back to center. So I can feel the energy in the room's changed already. Right? (laughs) You've gone very quiet. (laughs) It's really centering. Yeah. Yeah, It really is. Oh my gosh. Such a simple exercise and no one needs to know what you're doing in public. Mm -hmm. Feeling anxious or depressed or whatever it might be. Yeah. But it works. It stimulates the vagus nerve, which is really linked to Mm. trauma response. Oh, okay, wow. So you're regulating your system. Guys, yeah. check that out. I'm you guys got a say. free tip for two free tips. Two things. Two Lay free and direct. It's very funny. I do, I do when, I, when I'm anxious. Yes. Like, this is one of those things when that I do. When we did that, I was like, that's Lauren. It, right? But it's, yeah. not, it's not funny. Yeah. yeah. You think, too, you know, sometimes when people are talking and how they jest. Yeah. You know, if something's sad, oh, mm-hmm. you know, so yeah. very... Right, so that's mm-hmm. another Is thing. Is that all you know. part of that? Right, <gasps> just your connection to your body. It's yeah. that that felt intuitive sense, and that you know that is ultimately what we have to relearn to do mm-hmm. is to go back to trusting ourselves yeah. and knowing intuitively what we need because mm-hmm. we all know. Mm-hmm. And I feel that that's part of you know the biggest part of my work is educating people, mm-hmm. normalizing what they're experiencing, yeah. and empowering them, mm. and just getting them to reconnect to their bodies and their centers yeah. because. A lot of um, models of therapy can be about sort of the therapist is expert. And whilst mm-hmm. we have a lot of knowledge, that creates power in the relationship. Mm-hmm. But for me, what I want to do is to empower my clients mm. because ultimately they're the ones that are going to self-actualize. And they're right. the ones that have to take care of themselves outside the room and in between our sessions and yeah. when we finish working. And so for me, that's where the value in the work is. Because mm. I've always thought about... Um like my relationship with the with my therapist as they're teaching me the things I need to do because they can't do the thing for me, mm-hmm. you know? So it's really cool to hear someone professional, <laughs> you know, say that. I I'm really do love that. Well then, yeah. Yeah. You know, that you want to help people, you know, that they know. Yeah. You help people self-actualize. So it's really you, mm-hmm. you empowering them. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. cool. I love that. Yeah. I think we're all excited it. to work with you in the future. Yeah. Yes. We have to have mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but no drinking, ladies. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Leave your drinks at the door. Uh, we will. We will. All right. <laughs> it's I, such think, a I think the nature will be enough it's intoxication. Really oh, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like. You know, when we, when we see the horses or we do forest bathing, mm-hmm. or if, even if I it's really just a walk do the forest on the beach. 
Mm. No, I am not sure if I'm the walk on the beach or the forest bathing one. Like, I kind of want to do both. I think we can do I both. Like the, Maybe yeah, one session like walk on the beach, cool. and next se- yeah. session can forest bathing. Can we just bathing? do all of them? We're well, that's right. That's, that's okay. one of the services that I offer. It's mm-hmm. bespoke. So mm-hmm. whilst I've got prearranged one mm-hmm. or half day retreats, mm-hmm. you also can choose whatever services you want, and you can bring your friends or your family. Mm-hmm. You can choose to do forest bathing mm-hmm. and equine therapy mm-hmm. and a walk on the beach and have lunch. You know, Why? choice is yours. Mm-hmm. And we've got miniature donkeys now to come and hug. <gasps> yeah. They're very okay. cute. Yeah. Oh, okay, you calm down. <laughs> <laughs> Last question, I promise. Right. Um, what, do you do organizational work? Because me in particular, we have just, and not only me, the whole government service, mm-hmm. we have all just gone back into the office after almost a year and a half from working remotely, mm-hmm. which I don't necessarily like. I'm definitely a type of person who wants to work in her own hours, in her own space. I'm not a morning person. I do not like getting up to go to work at 8.30 in the morning. However, I will work from 2 o'clock all the way to 7, 8 o'clock and just do all my work. Because those are the hours where I'm up and I'm about and I'm more comfortable. Mm-hmm. So it was a little traumatizing for me. I know a lot of other people. You know, you're, we're walking around the office. Everybody's kind of moaning and groaning. But we, we have jobs. So you kind of have to do what you have to do. Mm-hmm. But I also think it's it's really important for us. And I mean, we do work like at a really good office. Like They are cognizant of, of our mental health. It's like a conversation that we have had. Um, but in terms of doing work, for groups and offices and stuff like that especially yeah. persons who like because we've all been through this traumatic experience Fast. like like it or not and the work environment is a like it's a community too and most businesses can actually um benefit mm-hmm. from a service like that is that um, something that you do yes yeah it is so Ooh. um i think working in nature equine mm-hmm. assisted corporate work um mm-hmm. all lends itself to organizations because you're not only looking at the the mindfulness healing Mm -hmm. stress reduction side Mm -hmm. particularly when you're working with a herd of horses they pick up stuff and you can use that as a platform that's far more powerful than if you have a group in a room with a flipboard yeah Yeah. right so if you've got um for example a very uh, sort of dictator type Mm -hmm. authoritarian bully even in a team Mm -hmm. um trying to for me to try and communicate or get to the bottom of it or for your Mm -hmm. boss whoever Mm -hmm. might be through sort of a clipboard or mm-hmm. it's not going to work people yeah. shut down number one so you mm-hmm. haven't got that communication whereas the horses um we don't know how but we think it's through um mirroring mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in the brain um they will split into the click so if you've got a very dominant person they'll start reenacting it mm-hmm. you can imagine if you're stood there so you kind of kind of can't get away from it so yeah it already gives me information that that's going on mm-hmm. within the group i've had it also where i'm working with a couple um you know and, and there might be sort of an abuser in the relationship. Mm-hmm. And again, the, the horses reenact that and it's incredibly powerful. Wow. Um, but aside to those sorts of issues, mm-hmm. um, just re-regulating yourself, mm-hmm. reconnecting from mind into body, mm-hmm. um, touch. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, yeah, you can do all sorts of exercises with equines. So not just yeah. the horses, but with the miniature donkeys too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We do really fun um, team building exercises yeah. with them. And what actually is really powerful working with the animals, particularly the equines, is the nonverbal work. Mm-hmm. Because something that I, I didn't get to mention um, throughout this conversation that I think is really important is that over hundreds of years we've evolved mm-hmm. to move out of our bodies, mm-hmm. which we've always used as sensing tools mm-hmm. for communication. And we've come out and now we rely solely on our cognitive processes. Yeah. So the equine and the animal work and the nature work is about reconnecting yeah. with the body. And what you can relearn, because we all intuitively know it, is nonverbal communication. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we all do it, but we, we kind of lost touch with it. Mm-hmm. So you can feel if you live with somebody mm-hmm. else in a house, there's yeah. maybe been an argument. Yeah. You can walk into the room and you can feel that. Mm-hmm. All right, so that's part of your sensing tool. But also that sensing can keep us safe. So if we've got mm-hmm. danger, connects to part of the brain called the amygdala. Yeah. So, um, yeah, nonverbal communication, so mm-hmm. boundaries, sort of where you want someone to stand, all sorts yeah. of things that we, yeah. we're more powerful than we realize, but we've cut that part of ourselves mm-hmm. off. Whoa. Yeah. So if we want to say, um, not even just for like corporate side of things, but like say you have like maybe your family group or whatever you want to come in and have a session um, and you don't necessarily want to like commit to like, okay, I'm going to come every week this week. 
um, this month, sorry, um, blah, blah, blah. Like, are there like different like plans that you can set up to suit what you're doing, what you want, what you want to do? Can yeah, absolutely. It's a great question because um, my clinical experience has taught me that that's not always practical financially, yeah. mm-hmm. time wise, and through choice mm-hmm. for people. Um, so I think we were talking off uh, a mm-hmm. while ago about. A lot of practitioners will say that they're working in a client-led, person-centered mm-hmm. model, mm-hmm. but actually they're still dictating that they come to a certain place in a mm-hmm. room at a certain time for a certain amount of time for so many mm-hmm. sessions, yeah. which, of course, you've got a lot of commitment in many different ways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I have redesigned my model, and there is an evidence base for what we call single-session single, single session therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been around for decades, actually. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I also mentioned that in my new publication. Um, along oh, with what's nature. the name of your? Um... I would have to look it up on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's got, it's got it's exactly some right. fancy title that I just came up with one day. <laughs> um, but yes, that's um, that's with the editors at the moment. So yeah, I can look that up for you. Also, it's not even like available for the to the public as yet. Not yet. No, it's just it's just going through the How editing that? stage. Oh, wow. yeah. So guys, we're getting a, so, a preview. Yeah, you know, saying we're in the know. Yeah, look yeah. at that. Look at that. <laughs> so this the title is psychotherapy in nature. Mm-hmm. Exploring an alternative psychotherapeutic framework to address the limitations of working in traditional settings, mm-hmm. in order to move with the times. Wow. So I can read you some of the abstract if you want to yes, give you an idea. That would be lovely, mm-hmm. thank you. So I'm doing this without my glasses, so bear with me. <laughs> we all understand. Don't worry, I don't have my glasses. We all do. Yeah. We all do. <laughs> so this paper introduces nature therapy and single session therapy mm-hmm. as alternative psychotherapeutic frameworks in addition to more traditional ways of working, offering a modern perspective on evolving societal and individual needs. In particular, the concern for human coping mechanisms and survival in today's fast-paced environment dictates a growing need to address conflicts of inner and outer lived experiences, dissociation and trauma, where traditional settings are failing or inadequate. Ethical considerations and applications to working outside in nature are discussed, as as well as limitations for traditional settings. This paper can be used as an introductory guide for practitioners seeking to work therapeutically in nature. Nice. Oh, wow. So I think the reason I wanted to kind of share that with you mm-hmm. is because it kind of answers what we were just talking about. Mm-hmm. So there is an evidence base for the single session framework mm-hmm. and to um, collaborate that with working in nature or with horses or dogs, yeah. animals, yeah. is a really powerful going mm-hmm. to that bottom up multidimensional process, yeah. the body mind. So people can book just for a session mm-hmm. and it is, you know, I know I'm um, biased, but it mm-hmm. is... 10 times as effective as a rainbow setting. And mm-hmm. as I mentioned much earlier on, though, you know, there is a science for that yeah. in terms yeah. of the brain and it's shutting down and so on. And, you know, we, we store trauma in the body as mm-hmm. well. So mm-hmm. working particularly with equine or dogs mm-hmm. and in nature really um, targets those body memories. Yeah. Yeah. So people can book one-off sessions. They can book for... I try to make it a bespoke service, and I think the metaphor that always comes to my mind is going to a pick and mix sweet shop. <laughs> so you could do forest bathing, equine therapy mm-hmm. with horses or donkeys, um, go to the beach, uh, walk and talk anywhere, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and you can design your own half day, day, residential stay. I've got various yeah. different locations I work from. So mm-hmm. the aim is to try and reach a large audience, yeah. mm-hmm. depending on your budget. Mm-hmm. Um, I think something we were talking of off air as well is, um, you know, potentially people are seeing the service as being very expensive, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but it's unique, it's powerful, mm-hmm. and it actually is empowering you to be mm-hmm. able to pick and choose when and what type of therapy you want. Yeah. I mm-hmm. think also, um, for me, it addresses the confidentiality, mm-hmm. aside to the fact that I hold those boundaries. Yeah. Um, people aren't having to walk into a waiting room. Yeah. yeah. Park up, walk in who's in the waiting room, who's mm-hmm. watching when I come out. Yeah. You know, that has all been part of the way I've designed how I work. Yeah. Because these are real challenges and barriers for people engaging in therapy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love it. It sounds amazing. I know. And I honestly, like, just from this this conversation we've had, I can't wait to, like, have further conversations mm-hmm. with you in mm-hmm. future. Honestly, I think a lot of the things that we touched on today um are very very necessary Mm -hmm. especially today 
especially especially today so yeah, for us thank personally. you so much you're welcome yeah thank you for having me and i can't wait for us to be able to sit with you and maybe have one of your half day or full day retreat i mean come on because i definitely think that we deserve it and we need it i think everybody <laughs> deserves deserve it i think it. you deserve yeah. it too. we deserve <laughs> so i i definitely think we should do it fantastic you know? well and have a look at the yourself. website yeah well, yeah. <laughs> the website we can link that below right yeah and um, link link the IG and the, the Facebook pages too yeah, yeah. Well, follow me yes I'm going to be doing um, hopefully eventually mm -hmm. some um, some more videos so questions and answers on anxiety yeah. and those sorts of things and oh, yeah, yeah. I'm really keen to share some of the techniques that we've mm -hmm. talked about today That'll but it would be, be really wonderful helpful. for us to, to do another one where we can really engage people and try yeah. and help them yeah yeah Thank you so much for coming. You're Honestly, welcome. thanks for having me. I oh. appreciated it. Yes, so it was cool. it was like amazing. I didn't expect this. At I really all. didn't. I'm not gonna lie to you. I didn't expect this. At all. I didn't expect to feel so centered and so like it's yeah. okay. You're okay. We can move forward. You know, mm. like to me, it was just a really centering experience. Yeah. Like, so. And this wasn't even a session. Like. It wasn't even. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but we're ready for the session. We are. We really <laughs> are ready for the session. So cool. So if you have not liked her pages and you haven't linked her website, please feel free to do that. Yes. Thank you check so her much out for seeing with us. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, guys. I'm Jerry. I'm Lauren. I'm Chian. And we're three drinks in now. <laughs> <laughs>